You will hear a woman phoning about the shared house she is going to move into. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 1 to 7. Hello? Hello, this is Hilary. I'm calling about the house. I'm moving in next week. Oh yes, Hilary. This is Judith. I met you when you came to look at the house. Yes. I just had a few more questions I wanted to ask. Of course. Well, first, about the rent. I realise I didn't check what it included. Yes, that's important. It includes most things. We don't have to pay extra for heating, for example, just for the telephone, which is fair enough, I suppose. Local taxes are part of the rent, so that's not a worry. That's fine. Then I remember I should have sent my letter of reference to the landlord by now, but I haven't got his address. Yes, you should get that off right away. Address it to Mr Crawley. He's at 14 King Street. Is that in Exford? Yes. And then you'll need to put the postcode, of course. It's AP12... Mm-hmm. 7QT. Got that. Thanks. I also realise I don't know exactly what the house has in the way of equipment. Is there a microwave, for example? There isn't. None of us feels the need. Oh, fine. I'm sure I can do without one, too. What about a hairdryer? Maybe you should bring one, if you need one. I'll buy one, yes. And TV? Oh, yes. We've got two, in fact. Was there anything else? I just wondered if there were any rules. Not really. We share the cleaning, things like that. We do have to be careful about loud music. Yes. So we've agreed that there shouldn't be any loud music after nine and that we don't play music at all in the living room after ten. Up to eleven in your own room's OK, as long as it's not too noisy. That sounds good. And is there somewhere safe I can keep my bike? That's difficult. To be honest... Lots do get stolen round here. We haven't got a garage, so we tend to park ours in the garden so that they're hidden from the street. OK. Now, I hope you like cooking. Yes, I do. Do you all have shared meals? Not very often, actually. But when the weather's good in the summer, we like to have a barbecue together, which we do each Wednesday. We tend to go out at weekends. Sounds fun. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. Are you familiar with this area? A bit. Actually, there are a few things that I'd like to know the location of. A bank, for example. Yes, there's one quite close. You just go up to the junction near the house, the one where four roads meet, and go straight ahead and then take the second left. It's a little way down there on the left-hand side. That's convenient. Another thing is that I'd like to check my emails quite often. I was wondering how far away an internet cafe was. Well, there are a couple, actually, but one's much cheaper than the other. The one I use is very handy. You just go up to the big junction and then... Well, I go straight ahead and then turn right so that it's on the right-hand side. Fine. And one last thing. 
Uh-huh. I need to go to the post office quite often. I'm hoping there's one quite close to the house. You're in luck. You'd walk up to the big junction, and then, if you want a nice route, take the street that's slightly to the right. Then you'd want the second left, and you'd find it on the right side of the street. Well, it all sounds great. So, we'll see you in a couple of days' time? Yes. OK. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a tour guide talking to her tour group. First, you will have time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Well, we certainly have a busy day ahead of us, so let's get started, shall we? You'll find a map of the museum with the itinerary I've just handed out. The museum's our first port of call, so uh, let's have a look at the map now. The door on the right of the entrance hall leads into the gift shop and ticket centre. Once we pick up our entrance tickets, I'd ask everyone to deposit their bags and coats in the cloakroom, which is located towards the back of the gift shop and ticket centre. If you want to pick up an information leaflet, you can approach the information desk situated along the right-hand side. Now, once you come back into the entrance hall, the door on the opposite side to the gift shop leads into the art gallery. There is a special exhibition on there at the moment which is not to be missed. If you continue on up the entrance hallway, that leads into the main exhibition centre. At the back left-hand side, there are some toilets. Beside the toilets, you'll find the 3D theatre. I strongly recommend that you make time for the 30-minute presentation in the theatre. It is well worth a viewing. Running along the right-hand side of the main exhibition centre is the Modern Art Studio. Here, not only can you view some of the most famous works of the 20th century, but you can also sit in on a workshop run by a local artist. So, that's the Art Museum. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Next on the itinerary is the aquarium. Depending on how long we spend at the museum, we might have to give this one a miss. It's not what I'd call a highlight of the day, but it would be a shame if we didn't get to see it, as it's en route to the Solheim Country Club, where we're booked in for lunch at one o'clock. Originally, we had planned to stop off at the Milltown Winery afterwards, but we've had to scrap that plan, otherwise we'd never get to the zoological gardens before closing time. 
we have pre-booked the gardens and must be there by 2.30. So, no dilly-dallying, please, after lunch. Straight back onto the bus. The gardens close at 3.30, so we've an hour there, which should give us ample time to look around. Time allowing, we'll stop off at the famous Stout Brewery after that, if traffic isn't too heavy, and we're in Lincoln before five. If not, we'll head straight for the National Concert Hall, where you're in for a real treat of an evening, with a performance from the world-renowned cellist, Andre Borowski. We have to be in our seats by 6.30 sharp. After that, it's back to the hotel for the night, where a buffet meal will be waiting for us at half eight, or whenever we get back. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will now listen to a talk on bicycles. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Today, we're going to talk about the latest bikes for professionals and novices. There's something to suit everyone from price to function. The Atlantis is a touring frame. It's also perfect for commuting and trail riding, and anything short of super-fast road riding. The tubes are stout, to take touring loads and trail abuses. The tyre clearances are majestic, so you can fit tyres up to 2.35 inches. It's designed for cantilevers or V-brakes. If you have to limit yourself to just one bike and you want to be able to ride just about anywhere, this is the bike to be on. It is our most popular model for just that reason, and there isn't an unhappy Atlantis owner in the land. The Rambouille A, our all-around road bike, is available either as a frame with fork and headset for $1,400 or as a complete bike for $2,300. Compared to the Atlantis, it is a lighter frame, not intended for loaded touring or rough trail riding. As a road bike, it has side pull brakes. The Quick Beam is our version of the single speed bike. We've done it a little better though. The crankset has a 42-34 combination, running an 18-toothed freewheel cog in the rear. And the rear hub is threaded opposite the drive side, so you can install a fixed cog of your own choice. In essence, you can have four speeds on the quick beam if you choose. The quick beam is available as a frame with fork and headset for $900, or as a complete bike for $1,300. This is a rugged, versatile bike that you can ride on the road as well as on rough trail. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. The Saluki is our roadish, light-touring, randonneuring frame. It's designed for 650B wheels. 
If 650B means anything to you, you'll either love it or think it's marketing suicide. If you're new to 650B and a follower, you won't want it. If you're new and a rebel, you will. Now, I'll just talk a little about saddle comfort. The road bike, for the most part, has turned into a high-tech, uncomfortable machine, and the proof is all around us. Look through any bike magazine or catalogue, and you'll see the saddle up to six inches higher than the handlebars. It is impossible to be comfortable on such a bike. It forces you to lean forward, putting more weight on your groin, hands and arms. People ride these bikes with straight, locked-out arms and wake up with aching backs. They endure it, get used to it, or buy recumbents. When we custom design a bike for you, you'll be able to get a comfortable position. Your back will be between 45 and 50 degrees, and there will be a noticeable bend in the arms. And most importantly, your arms won't be supporting your body weight. You won't have to look up to look ahead, because you won't be hunched over and low. That means our bikes are more accessible for riding on the flats, or even for short climbs. We consider this when we design and build your custom frame. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a part of a lecture about learning and bilingualism. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40 on pages 44 and 45. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. When we look at theories of education and learning, we see a constant shifting of views as established theories are questioned and refined or even replaced. And we can see this very clearly in the way that attitudes towards bilingualism have changed. Let's start with a definition of bilingualism. And for our purposes today, we can say it's the ability to communicate with the same degree of proficiency in at least two languages. Now, in practical terms, this might seem like a good thing, something we'd all like to be able to do. However, early research done with children in the USA in fact suggested that being bilingual interfered in some way with learning and with the development of their mental processes. And so in those days, bilingualism was regarded as something to be avoided, and parents were encouraged to bring their children up as monolingual, just speaking one language. But this research, which took place in the early part of the 20th century, is now regarded as unsound for various reasons, mainly because it didn't take into account other factors, such as the children's social and economic backgrounds. Now, in our last lecture, we were looking at some of the research that's been done into the way children learn, into their cognitive development, and in fact we believe now that the relationship between bilingualism and cognitive development is actually a positive one. It turns out that cognitive skills such as problem solving, which don't seem at first glance to have anything to do with how many languages you speak, are better among bilingual children than monolingual ones. 
And quite recently, there's been some very interesting work done by Ellen Bialystok at York University in Canada. She's been doing various studies on the effects of bilingualism, and her findings provide some evidence that they might apply to adults as well. They're not just restricted to children. So how do you go about investigating something like this? Well, Dr Bialystok used groups of monolingual and bilingual subjects aged from 30 right up to 88. For one experiment, she used a computer program which displayed either a red or a blue square on the screen. The coloured square could come up on either the left hand or the right hand side of the screen. If the square was blue, the subject had to press the left shift key on the keyboard and if the square was red, they had to press the right shift key. So they didn't have to react at all to the actual position of the square on the screen, just to the colour they saw. And she measured the subject's reaction times by recording how long it took them to press the shift key and how often they got it right. What she was particularly interested in was whether it took the subject longer to react when a square lit up on one side of the screen, say the left, and the subject had to press the shift key on the right-hand side. She'd expected that it would take more processing time than if a square lit up on the left and the candidates had to press a left key. This was because of a phenomenon known as the Simon effect, where basically the brain gets a bit confused because of conflicting demands being made on it. In this case, seeing something on the right and having to react on the left. And this causes a person's reaction times to slow down. The results of the experiment showed that the bilingual subjects responded more quickly than the monolingual ones. That was true both when the squares were on the correct side of the screen, so to speak, and even more so when they were not. So bilingual people were better able to deal with the Simon effect than the monolingual ones. So what's the explanation for this? Well, the result of the experiment suggests that bilingual people are better at ignoring information which is irrelevant to the task in hand and just concentrating on what's important. One suggestion given by Dr Bialystok was that it might be because someone who speaks two languages can suppress the activity of parts of the brain when it isn't needed. In particular, the part that processes whichever language isn't being used at that particular time. Well, she then went on to investigate that with a second experiment. But again, the bilingual group performed better. And what was particularly interesting, and this is, I think, why the experiments have received so much publicity, is that in all cases, the performance gap between monolinguals and bilinguals actually increased with age, which suggests that bilingualism protects the mind against decline. So, in some way, the lifelong experience of managing two languages may prevent some of the negative effects of ageing. So, that's a very different story from the early research. So, what are the implications of this for education? That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.